In purely practical terms, Marxism must be far and away the most influential new philosophy to have appeared in the last 150 years or so. And I suppose most of us have a rough idea, anyway, of what its basic tenets are. One could put them, I think, like this. Everything that really matters about a society is determined by how it maintains itself in existence, because it's what people have to do to keep alive that really decides their relationship to nature and to each other, and therefore, ultimately, to everything that grows up on those bases. So the decisive thing in any society at any given time is what the means of production are. When they change, people's ways of life have to change, and the way individuals relate to each other has to change, and thus the organization of classes changes. So long as the means of production are in the hands of a section of society rather than the whole of it, a deep-seated conflict of class interests is inevitable. For this reason, the whole of history up to now is really a history of class struggles. This is bound to continue until the means of production are taken over by society as a whole, thereby abolishing classes in Marx's sense altogether, and held in common ownership and run in the common interest. The establishment of this new kind of society, i.e. communism, will inaugurate a whole new era of human history which will be different in kind from the past. However, since no ruling class can be expected voluntarily to give up its ownership of the means of production, with not only the wealth, but also the power, privilege and prestige which that confers, the forceful overthrow of the existing system is likely to be the only way in which communism can be established, and it's therefore, if only for that reason, justified. Well, something like that sketch map of Marxist theory is probably as much as most of us possess, and indeed, as far as it goes, it's accurate. But there's so much more to it than that. Marxism is a rich and powerful explanatory system whose intellectual history is colourful and interesting in its own right, as well as having an obvious practical influence on the world we live in. Well, in this programme, we're going to consider Marxism as a philosophy. To do so, we have someone with us who has a lifelong interest in the subject, the Canadian Charles Taylor. More than 20 years ago, as Chuck Taylor, a young fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, he was one of the founders of the New Left Movement in Britain. Since then, he's been Professor of Philosophy and Political Science at McGill University in Canada, has run as a candidate several times for the Canadian Federal Parliament, and has published a major book on Marx's philosophical progenitor, Hegel. Now, after all these years, he's back at All Souls as Professor of Social and Political Theory in the University of Oxford. <clears throat> well, Professor Taylor, I've started this program by giving a very rough but perhaps overbold outline of Marxist political and economic theory. And what we want to do now is to go into the philosophy that throws these things up to the surface, as it were. Now, where would you like to begin in discussing that? Well, I'd like to begin, pick up a point you made about how it's, what you said was right, but it's much richer. I mean, you gave a thumbnail sketch, a very good thumbnail sketch of Marx as an explanatory theory. But there's also another dimension, a theory of liberation, which I think accounts for the immense importance and excitement that this theory has, has generated for the last century. And you can start really from the same point. It's that human beings are what they are because of the way they make their lives, the way they produce the means to live, and they produce the means to live as a society, as a, as a group, not individually. So in a way, we could look at them just as another gregarious animal like ants or bees. But what differentiates them from ants or bees, Marx holds, is that human beings have this capacity to reflect on and change the way that they work on nature to produce the means to life. In other words, labor in the human sense, in Marx's view, incorporates this idea of, of reflection. And that means that they can change the way that they interact with nature over time. And that is the dimension that's proper to human. That means that over time, they can get greater and greater control, greater and greater capacity to take from nature what they need and to produce the means to human life. Now, this just doesn't just mean that they aren't monotonously uh, stocked like a certain animal species in the same way of doing things all the time, but over history, they actually get better. They actually realize this capacity to control nature to a greater and greater degree. In that sense, already we can see they become freer. That is, with the increase of technology, with their understanding of nature, with their capacity to reorganize their, their lives, 
human beings become more and more capable of controlling the way in which they interact with nature. And is part of the point here that, that a man in his most primitive state, when he's literally emerging from the animal state, is virtually enslaved by nature. He's subject to yes. all the natural forces the around realm him. The realm of necessity is the yes. way that Marx uses for this yes. very much. And yeah. that the historical process can be seen as the process of, of self-liberation from this enslavement. To nature, which is conversely, if you like, the process of the conquest of nature, that we are more and more mastering our material environment. Is, yes. is that, yes. that, that is the... Now, what makes Marxism a very interesting and rich theory is that there's another as it were, wing to this, that as we, as man progresses in history and as conquers nature, something else happens between human beings. Because Marx believed that the necessity, it was absolute necessity in order to progress, that human beings break up the original highly unified human society. There had to be a division of labor. There had to be the generation of a surplus which required very rigid discipline. And all this meant necessarily, inevitably, that some men would dominate others. In other words, there would be class division. And the tragedy of this, if you like, is that this great capacity to control our, our labor and our interaction with nature and our way of being in the world is something that we never can fully exercise because it's something we only could exercise as a whole human society together, whereas the, 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 the necessary requirement for progress in the beginning is that we break into class division. And the result is that instead of we're controlling freely our way of, of interacting with nature and, and getting the means to life from nature, we find that it escapes human control, that it follows a set of impersonal laws which no one, no individual person, no individual group can dictate. And of course the, the, the apex of this, at the highest point of human development in history before we recover control, is, is capitalism, and that Marx devoted his major work to, Capital. And we see in Capital, I mean, one, one way of putting a pencil sketch of Capital is that it's, an, it's a picture of a society, of an organization of society, which is governed by inexorable laws out of human control, in control of no individual, in which the laws of capital accumulation drive on and on and on to the destruction and immense suffering of human beings, which no one can, can control. So the paradox is, this is what Marx used the word alienation for, that this immense potential that human beings develop to write their own ticket, as it were, as, as animals in nature, which no other animal has, is as it were wrenched from their hands by their own internal divisions. Now comes the final culmination in which by a revolution, human society can recover control. Something that can only happen at the apex of history when the surplus has been generated and the means have been, as it were, gathered. Why does, I mean, why is this, so to speak, uh, almost magical act of revolution going to make everything right that's been wrong throughout history? What, what, how does the theory explain the that? The theory re really is that there is a bent in human nature, if you like to put it this way, towards ultimately free and therefore collective control together over their destiny. And this, this bent you can see is being frustrated by the fact that in previous history it just wasn't possible to take the first steps without paying the terrible cost of class-divided society. I mean, in very poor, indigent societies under primitive communism, it was necessary to break into dominators and dominated masters and servants in order to make the next step. I see. And it's when, when it no longer is necessary, ah, as I it see. were, yes. the, the Marxist theory yes. is, that a class will arise which is willing to take that step towards a, new, a revolution which will, for the first time, not simply produce another dominant class, but do away with domination altogether. Yeah. If I remember rightly, and absolutely, in, in a way, the key to this whole process, so in Marx's view, is the division of labor, isn't it? Because yes. uh, I believe he says that, that uh, in order for uh, human societies to develop beyond the very, very primitive stage, you have to have specialization. But once you have specialization, the individual is no longer producing everything that is responsible for his own maintenance. And he becomes dependent on others. He, he gets hived off into particular groupings with others. But he also becomes, so to speak, an instrument of production. He is somebody who is now being used for the purposes of others as well as himself to produce uh, uh, the means of livelihood for society as a whole. And, it, and yes. this starts the process that you just mentioned of alienation. Yes. He becomes someone who is, as it were, cut off or 
partially cut off from the means that sustain him. Yes, we are all at that point fragments of the social process and none of us can really understand or control it totally. And it follows from that, of course, that when we have a revolution in which we recuperate this control, that once again the division of labor is overcome. It's a very important theme in Marx that the division at least between workers by hand and workers by brain will be overcome. But now, I think the really exciting element in this, which has not always been brought out very clearly, but I think it's always there, what I call the liberation theory, is really this, that what human beings are about in history comes to be something very surprising. It, the motivation for all these earlier stages of history, moving from one system to another, is of course just acquiring the means to life, I mean the very dire necessity of keeping alive. But Marx had the view that it was part, if you like, of human ful fulfillment to exercise this capacity to control their lives for its own sake. As it were, that there was an expressive dimension, not simply an instrumental dimension to this. It becomes a form of self-realization. Self-realization, yes. And it's this dimension of self-realization which is utterly frustrated by class society. It, it, in other words, what Marx, you see Marx constantly saying in his works, both early and late, is that in class society, in capitalism, for instance, we have a society which at best simply produces in order to keep men alive. It's just the bare means, production is simply a means to keep alive, whereas <clears throat> man as a laboring animal ought to be capable of expressing himself in his labor as a human being. There's almost the vision of man as a collective man, social man, as a kind of artist expressing himself, which is were what awaits human beings once they can overcome this alienation. And I suppose the vision of the society to be achieved, communism, is a, is a vision of a society without internal divisions, without classes, without master and man, yes. uh, and without alienation. Exactly. It's an overcoming of, of alienation, and which means that all the capacity that human beings have to control their lives are put to the service of their expressive uh, drive and aspirations. That's, I think, the, in, a, in a nutshell, what overcoming yeah. alienation means. Now, uh, it's very clear that this philosophy has had an enormous influence uh, on the modern world and on all of us. And it's also pretty clear to me, anyway, that it contains very important elements of truth. What would you say are, are so to speak, the, the good things about the philosophy, or the things that we all have learnt from, or at least ought to have learnt from, even if we haven't? Well, I would say... Of the two sides that we've looked at, the explanatory yeah. theory and then the richer liberation theory, the explanatory theory, in a way, we're all in a, some degree Marxist now, in the sense that it gave us a reading of history in terms of, of the precisely the way in which human beings make the means to life. And it gave us insights into history which no one can go back on, however much there may be arguments about how far to take it. When you get to the liberation theory, it's a much more checkered and controversial question. And it, it's undoubtedly given us, I think, one of the one of the richer and more interesting insights into the development of modern man, the the immense importance that freedom has for people in modern civilization, the way that uh, people pine after it and uh, struggle for it, and so on. At the same time, it's been the source of one of the biggest problems within Marxism itself, because these two sides of the theory explanatory theory and the liberation theory don't always fit too well together. I mean, I mean can, can, can you show how yes, they, I think they we can don't see that fit together? By example, I mean, if you want to look at Marxism simply as, in the almost Newtonian sense, scientific theory explaining human history, doing for development history what Newton did for the planets, then you get a view of inexorable law which governs human beings at any period of time, isn't as Newton's laws of the planets govern the planet's motions at any period of time. But then what disappears is something in the liberation theory of Marxism, which is something of this kind, that as we make the revolution from capitalism to communism, we recover control over certain facets of our lives, which previously under capitalism are, as it were, under the control of inexorable law. The idea that <clears throat> some, at one point in history, some things are controlled by laws, which then are recuperated, if you like, for, for freedom. This is an idea that doesn't fit neatly into a model of Newtonian science. In other and words, I mean, what Marx, what Marx is suggesting is, is that up to a certain point in history, namely the communist revolution, all historical events are, co are covered by laws which have the character of scientific laws, and suddenly there's going to be some kind of break so that man will after that become free and therefore not governed well, except by Except the liberation theory laws. wouldn't be that, that uh, crude. I mean, it would be of this kind, really, that as the different societies succeed each other in history, I mean, feudalism, capitalism, and so on, 
you get very different kinds of laws governing people and things that are under control and control at one period cease to be at other periods and vice versa. And it's only with the arrival of communism that we get um, an another such change, but at this point a change which has an unprecedented degree, incorporates an unprecedented degree of control. But the idea would be that there would be quite a great qualitative differences between the kind of laws applying under uh, ancient society, feudal society, and communist society. Against this, however, you have the kind of, the way that Marxism came to be considered, quite understandably, in late Victorian period, the period of Darwin, the, the period of, of, you might say, scientism as a kind of ideology, when it's seen as an inexorable set of, of, of laws. Now, within Marxism itself, these two sides have gone on struggling. You know, as a political movement, it can't abandon either one, because it's, I think its political punch precisely con uh, depends on holding on to both of them. I mean, it has to hold on to the liberation theory because that is the, if you like, the whole messianic future that it can open to man. And it has to hold on to the claim to being a science because that stamps it as something quintessentially modern, which has overcome superstition and which can have a really solid foundation. But any, that's a level of politics. Any Marxist theoretician has been in one way or another deeply embarrassed with this and they've taken different different roads. There is a very popular school today which has decided to jettison the liberation theory almost altogether. Think I think many people listening to this discussion between us will be surprised at your emphasis on half of Marxism being a theory of liberation because in many people's minds I think Marxism is bound to be associated with uh, a form of totalitarianism. Um, there are very, very few people left anywhere in the world now, I think, who actually regard, say, the Soviet Union as in any serious sense a free country. Uh, the communist countries uh, are dictatorships of one sort or another. And how then, people will be asking themselves, how can a theory of liberation be the ideology of this kind of society? Yes, I think it's a very cruel paradox, but I think it's one that explains a great deal of it explains just why the Soviet Union is such a totalitarian country. It is if it were content merely to be an autocracy, as its predecessor regime, uh, Tsarism, was, it wouldn't need to interfere with, control, shape people's lives as much as it, as it tries to do. But it's because it's a, a regime which is based on ideology of liberation, it has to be the case that everybody not only obeys, but likes it, but believes in it. And any evidence, serious evidence that people don't, that they find it spiritually empty, has to be crushed. I mean, people have to be at the, at the limit, even put in insane asylums, partly because one has to believe that such people must be insane to see a system of this kind as, as spiritually empty. It's because it has these tremendous claims. And again, you were mentioning earlier that the liberation theory in Marxism, in a way, looks on man as an artist. And therefore, for Marxist movements, again, what artists say, hold, believe, express, become supremely important. According to the theory, they ought to be in that society expressing and celebrating what that society is about. And when they turn out not to be, it's something absolutely intolerable, and therefore they have to be suppressed. This brings us to a, a consideration, I think, of what the main shortcomings in the theory are. I don't, I don't want us to get hived off into a discussion of the Soviet Union, which would be very yeah. fascinating. I want us to try and keep to talking about Marxist philosophy. But it does seem to me that one of the mistakes in the theory is that the theory posits, with the achievement of communism, a society within which there are no conflicts. Now, it seems to me that this is even theoretically unattainable. Um, for example, wherever you get two people together, you are bound to have conflicting interests and conflicting opinions and so on. And almost the central problem of politics could be described as being, how do you solve such conflicts if not by brute force, if not by the law of the jungle. I mean, in one sense, this is what politics is primarily about. And I think we now realize, more than people did in the 19th century, that the, that the physical resources of the world, the material resources of the world, are cruelly finite. And there are always going to be disputes about how they should be used in any kind of society. So, in any kind of society, you're going to get conflicts. And Marxism doesn't give us any way of resolving these because it denies that in its form of society there are going to be any conflicts at all. Yes. And I think, can I just add a point here, Chuck? I don't want to go on talking too long at this point. But I want just to add the point that I think that this is connected with 
the reason why Marxism is, so to speak, bad about freedom, because it doesn't acknowledge the possibility of conflict in its kind of society, it has no way of coping with a situation when the individual is at odds with society, or when minorities are at odds with majorities, because it says that can't happen. Would you agree that there is that? Well, yes, I think that you're being a bit unfair in the sense that a Marxist would reply here that there is, they do foresee certain kinds of conflict, but basically, I think the basic point, that they foresee that the really deep conflicts, that which make people take up cudgels against each other, are grounded in economic exploitation and, and will disappear. And I agree with you, but I, I do agree with your basic point that emerges from that, that they're powerless to cope with they have no resources that were intellectually or otherwise to cope with with conflict and no model of how to operate a society in which conflict could arise and there's a very deep feeling that if you begin to allow for that you're going beyond the bounds of marxism i think that's certainly true what do you think are other important shortcomings of the theory as a theory well in a way something we should have raised in connection with the soviet union it's the opposite of of the criticism of the soviet union it's that it all happened in a country like the Soviet Union and not in a Western advanced country because the theory of Marx was definitely to the effect that communism would come about in the most advanced industrial societies. I mean, in a way, just as you can say what's happening in the Soviet Union is no test of Marxism, so on the other hand you have to say that the biggest intellectual question put to Marxism is why hasn't it happened in Britain, in Germany? And I think that uh, this is both a major, one of the major shortcomings of the theory and one of the major sources, one of the major areas of continuing discussion by Marxists. Would you, would you agree with me also that Marxism is very limited in the following sense, that, that with, so to speak, the great philosophies of the world or the major ideologies or major religions, they, they provide ex explanations of, of, uh, of the world on, one can put it very crudely, by, by saying it this way, they provide explanations on three different levels. The individual level, the human individual with his unique life and death and consciousness and knowledge and uh, uh, soul if he has one and moral sense and so on. And a whole cluster of important philosophical problems, the mind-body problem, the problem of the self and so on, relating to the individual. Then there is uh, uh, the social level, of political, social problems, historical problems, and so on. And then there's the level of problems concerning the natural world, the cosmos, the material world, with fundamental uh, questions arising about the nature of time and space and the whole uh, material structure within which human life finds itself. Now, it seems to me that, that uh, the great theories, the great philosophies, are, are richly explanatory on all three of these levels. Whereas Marxism isn't. Marxism almost totally ignores two of them. It ignores uh, the level of the natural world and the, has nothing to say about the cosmos and really has almost nothing to say about the individual. It's a, it's a theory that functions entirely on that intermediate level of social existence. Well, I'm not sure I agree with you on that. Having nothing to say about the cosmos, I'm afraid that in some cases they have too much to say about the cosmos. Their development out of Engels, which you now have in the Soviet mm. Union, of the dialectics of nature, which I think is in a lot of nonsense philosophically. Really, it would be better if Marxism had nothing to say about the natural cosmos. What modern ideology or, or religion does? I think that a much more powerful criticism of yours would be that it had nothing to say about the personal level. And I wonder, however, if that's entirely true. It's, it's true up to now, the historical record, that not much has been said by Marxists. I don't know how much that is some kind of historical accident, that Marxism has been taken up very powerfully by important political movements, which have had other things to think about than, and indeed have wanted to suppress certain questions about the individual. When you see the rich resources of Marxism as a theory of liberation, you see the kind of theory of art that could emerge from that. It's possible to conceive of a, another development of our culture, you can imagine it happening, in which that side of Marxism could really be explored, could be given the kind of exploration and development that Marxist economics has been given, or Marxist theory of development has been given. We have just a few signs of it, really, in Marxist aestheticians, Marxist theorists of, of art. And I, there could be an ultimate question arising there, whether 
the individual, as we've understood it in the past, the lonely individual who very often faces the most dramatic and important aspects of his life alone, whether Marxism could ever properly capture this may indeed be a question, but it's a question we don't know the answer to a priori because this is a very underdeveloped side of, of Marxism. It would be, would be interesting and very exciting if there were such a turn in our cultural life that our Marxist thinkers, instead of being very exclusively focused on theories of why the revolution didn't take place or why it will take place tomorrow or theories of the state and so on, in which sometimes diminishing returns seem to be coming in, and could be a focus on greater development of Marxist theory of art, theory of, of human aesthetic experience, moral experience. It could be something, there have been certain beginnings which have ne never been really taken up, which could be something quite interesting. Do you regard the acceptance or indeed advocacy of violence as being a strike against the philosophy or the theory? Well, you can't say that an advocacy of violence is such, because there's very few theories except outright pacifist ones. I mean, a great theoretician like Locke of, the, of liberalism advocates revolution in certain circumstances. But I do think, I, I think there is a point in what you're saying there, that <clears throat> the very belief that one can achieve a kind of conflictless society beyond the revolution gives you a kind of license to destroy and undercut what exists now, and to do so even violently, as long as you think that what's going to come out of it is going to be a conflictless realm of, of harmony. And it's noted about it that the certainty with which, which was Marxist uh, political figures or people who believe in this, the um, very often the facility with which they accept the idea that one should destroy a system violently or <clears throat> violently uh, upset it, I think, is a, is a feature of, you might say, their messianic hope. Because, and also in individuals and in groups, it only too easily becomes an assumption that it's all right for them to use violence in pursuit of whatever their aims are, doesn't it? But that does, of course, follow from the theory, because yes. if yes. the theory is right, they yes. are on the right side. But there's also yes, the, there's there's a, it's, yes. it's a perpetual, Marxism is a perpetual theory of the just war applied to politics in, in history. Applied to history, almost. Yes. Yes. Any theory yes. of the just war says yes. that we're right and they're wrong. I mean, that's, yes. but that's not peculiar to. But, <clears> now, <throat> but now, what exactly is the status of this theory? I mean, it claims to be scientific, and in Marx's own writings, this is reiterated over and over again, that he is putting forward a scientific view. And I suppose what he really meant was that whereas other socialists have been uh, either seeing lovely visions mm -hmm. of an ideal society or issuing uh, moral demands. He wasn't doing that. What he was doing or trying to do was to look at the actual uh, sociological processes at work in society and seeing where they would lead him. Uh, he was claiming all the time that he was taking a scientific approach. But one is struck, in fact, by, 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 by the amount of prophecy in this theory, isn't one? By all the claims and assertions about the future, uh, which actually don't look very scientific when you examine them closely. Well, actually, he, Marx is quite uh, careful about claims in the future in any detail. He hedged a lot about the future nature of communist society and what would happen. I mean, the big claim is the breakdown of capitalism, the big claim about the future, which is yet to be redeemed by, <laughs> by the facts. Yeah. But I... The word, the word in German meaning science, as you know, Wissenschaft, has a much broader sense, and people talk very happily in German about historical science, and, as well as about the science of physics. And it's it covers any, that it's whole, any form of intellectual, form of activity, intellectual activity, really, isn't it? Yes. But I think it's undoubtedly true that, anyway, as Marx <clears throat> developed, he came to see the firmness and, and rigorousness of his science of capitals being absolutely on all fours with that of, of physics. And do you think that just can't can be, be sustained? No, it can't. But I don't think it can be sustained uh, in principle for any theory which purports to deal with human beings, their motivation, their history, yes. their society, how they develop. The, that kind of rigor, that kind of exactitude, that kind of verification mm. just can't be. Of course, I think one ought to add in fairness to Marx that the notion of, of what constitutes science has changed radically in the hundred years since he wrote, that, that, that all well-informed men in the middle of the 19th century thought that scientific knowledge was a specially secure and certain yes. and infallible they were and incorrigible up, kind yes. of knowledge, <coughs> yes. whereas now that view has been virtually universally abandoned and we realize that science is fallible, science is corrigible, and, uh, uh, th and, and therefore, I mean, we... 
Marx himself would take a different view now if he were yes, writing. Yes, certainly, because he would have different models. Yes. 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 And that, too, wouldn't fit very well with, as you say, the messianic side. It really was a 19th century belief. Of, you know, Darwinism cleaned up this area, and we had all, that all clear, and, and physics had cleaned up this area, and now Marx was, as it were, cleaning up, finally, the area of human social history. One <clears> parallel <throat> that's been drawn by a lot of other people is, the, is, is between Marxism and the religion, and I'd like to invite your comments on this. Uh, what the people who make the parallel point out is that it has, uh, so to speak, its sacred books, and it has its prophets, and its sects, and its schisms, and its persecutions, and its heretics, and and the whole kind of setup, the the whole way in which Marxism and communism has developed is strikingly like a religion. Even the spread is like a religion. I mean, I do think that uh, an absolutely astounding fact about Marx is that a uh, hundred years ago he was a, an almost unknown uh, refugee intellectual living in this country on the charity of friends and living in lodgings and working all day in the British Museum reading room, studying and writing and so on. And within less than 70 years of his death, the death of this intellectual scribbler, uh, within less than 70 years of his death, a third of the human race is living under governments, under regimes that actually call themselves by his name, that call themselves Marxists. I mean, the whole of China, the whole of Russia and its 19th century empire, the, the whole of Eastern Europe. This is an astounding thing. And the only similarity to it, it seems to me, in the whole of history is the spread of Islam and the spread of Christianity. Now, what, how would you comment on those parallels with a religion? Well, I think undoubtedly, Orthodox established Marxism in Soviet Union or China mm. resembles in, in the respects you've mentioned. Religious movements in the past uh, imposed orthodoxy, and indeed the, the 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 worst dimension of an imposed orthodoxy. But when you go back to Marx himself, Marx is writing himself. What is the religious element there? And I think there's something there which is the kernel to all that, along with the scientific outlook, and that is that Marxism is so obviously related to the messianic tradition, the millenarist tradition of European. Uh, movements, movements in the Middle Ages, foreseeing the coming of the, the new order, of the new world the, that broke out in the time of the Reformation. Indeed, were there in a way in the extreme sects of the French Revolution who had the same idea of a new beginning. They started, you know, in 1791, I think it was, a new calendar, Law 1. And this is a very important feature via Hegel, via the works of Hegel, which fed into Marxism particularly the idea that there will be a period of maximum strife, maximum suffering, a great final struggle just preceding the introduction of a new age of harmony, peace, fulfillment. Now, this is not necessarily incompatible with science. I mean, if it did turn out to be the case that Marx's view of human history was right, then it would turn out that messianic movements had been uncommonly prescient, just as certain myths... Uh, as it were, our forerunners of, of atomic theories and so on. But it's, there's no doubt that right or wrong, this is part, has been part of the very powerful appeal of, of the theory. This, however, is still very far from what you were pointing out, the established the elements of established religion with heresy trials and the holy office and all the paraphernalia, which has grown up where Marxist societies have established themselves officially. But, I mean, you, you do agree that that parallel Exists oh, yes. Well. I mean, unquestionably. Unquestionably. Yes, yes, yes. Now, this really takes me naturally to the next question I wanted to put to you, which is this. In view of all the things that we've agreed are either wrong with Marxist theory, or if that's too crude a way of putting it, in view of the limitations and shortcomings of the theory, how does one explain the spellbinding appeal that this theory has had to so many such enormous numbers of people. I mean, you, you've begun, so to speak, halfway to answer this now in, in, in what you've been saying. Yes. But I'd like you to, to unpack that a little more. Yes, I think that if we go back to these two sides of it and see that it combines them, some of the most important, some of the most appealing theories in history have been the theories that combine two things that people want to combine and they can't easily combine in life. And the claim to be a science, to be something firmly established, to be something very much of modern times, which has cast off all the superstition of the old days, and yet at the same time answering that deep hunger for a new age, a new era of freedom, of fulfillment, that these two can be held together, I think has been a very powerful claim, very powerful appeal. And it's gone right through a tremendous gamut, I mean, all the way from 
intellectuals, semi-disabused intellectuals in Western societies, for whom Marxism is very much a, a private orientation to their, their studying, whatever they're studying, because they haven't maybe a, a, a popular movement, but, but are, as we're attracted by the same combination from their point of view, all the way to third world countries, third world populations, where because there's been a rapid breakdown of an established set of traditions, something new has to take its place, some new global picture of, of life, particularly one that offers a future and that can claim to be modern. And the same mixture, seen from a different angle, so we're a new heaven and a new earth, but established by science, by what is quintessentially modern, has its appeal. And so we have this tremendous gamut of different publics and different kinds of people which this combination can, can appeal to. It may be that um, Marxism may be eclipsed in this, I mean, in this, in this second function by, as it already in a way has been partly, by nationalism. Or, or we may find, and this is perhaps unlike religion, a whole lot of hybrids growing up which have taken, in, in different societies in the world today, official ideologies which have taken some things from Marxism and mix them up with other elements which are terribly important in that society, particularly national elements, so that we will have um, African socialism or uh, Arab socialism, all of which owe something to Marxism but may try to make it part of a, of a broader mix. But in all these cases, you can see an attempt to do the same kind of thing, to have a global view of things, perhaps also which saves the tradition from which people come, and yet which can claim somehow to be radically new, a new beginning, quintessentially modern, and founded on the most solid establishment of modern civilization, namely science. And now we come to what for many people is, I think, the $64 question, and that is the relationship of all this to actual uh, communist societies. Uh, and the relationship and the problems exhibited by the relationship are one of the central themes of modern Marxist writers. Uh, let me put it to you this way. There seem to be two basic schools of thought about this relationship. One says that, the, that uh, societies like the Soviet Union are a perversion of the, system, of, of the theory, that they are the theory gone wrong. And, and one such school of thought blames Stalin and Stalinism for what went wrong and so on. But there's another school of thought that says, no, uh, this outcome was always implicit in the theory. And one interesting fact about that is that from the beginning, it contained many revolutionary left-wing people. For example, the early, some of the early anarchists, Proudhon and Bakunin, <coughs> always prophesied that if Marxist theories were put into effect, they would issue in a despotism, a, a, a dictatorship. And later on you get Rosa Luxemburg, the revolutionary uh, leader of the German socialists at the time of the First World War, saying that if Lenin's yes. views were put into effect, they would be bound to issue in a pre state. Now, which of those two uh, views, roughly speaking, do you sympathize with? Well, Rosa Luxemburg, I mean, she was saying Lenin's views, not Marx's views. And yeah. I think that. That is the right uh, theory. I mean, of course, if you go back to any theorist who never had his theory put into effect in his lifetime, but was just theorizing, you can find a great many things that, uh, with this attitude and that attitude, can lead to almost any result. Think of the academic game people play with Rousseau. Is he totalitarian? Is he liberal? And so on. There's no doubt, however, that in Marx's view, what ought to follow from a revolution would be, well, indeed, he discussed the French Commune of 1871 in these terms, would be... Uh, even more radical, basic democracy than we have in any Western society today, with the recall of, of delegates and so on. The, um, the type of command society we see developing in the Soviet Union very much emerges, however, out of Leninism, out of Lenin's view of the party as a, a, a command structure, and out of the situation in which Lenin found himself. So I think that there's a little bit of overwisdom after the fact in reading all that back into Marxism. The only thing you can say is that the very idea, the very belief that one is going to bring about a conflictless society ill-equips one, as you said earlier, ill-equips one to develop a model for how to work in conflict. That Marx would have had a great deal of trouble if his theories had actually worked out in his lifetime. But from that to say that he had something like the germs of a totalitarian system in his mode of operating, which I think Lenin unquestionably had, 
I think it's a great, great jump, and it's not at all justified. Yeah. How, given that the uh, that all of the known uh, Marxist movements that have actually come to power have institute have resulted, in fact, in bureaucratic dictatorships. How do you think they're going to get out of this? Do you think they will have to abandon, that the societies will have to abandon the theory of Marxism if they are to evolve into non-dictatorial societies? Or do you think they can do that on the basis of some reconstructed yes. Marxism? I mean, they, it's very unlikely the Soviet Union will do this on the basis of a reconstructed Marxism, but it is possible. I mean, ever since this shock occurs of Marxism taking over and making such a horrifying regime, there has been attempts by what are called revisionists, other Marxists, many in the West, but elsewhere, even some in Yugoslavia, to work out, to rediscover their Marxism. And extremely interesting and fruitful ideas have been developed along these, these lines. I think you began to see in 68 in Czechoslovakia the beginnings of a society, some of whose sources, some of whose intellectual sources, would have been revised Marxism of a, of a free society, which was nipped in the bud. And a substantial amount of thought has gone on, as I mentioned, in Yugoslavia, where, again, it's not really very possible to put it into practice. Indeed, those who think these thoughts, have, some of them have lost their, their jobs. But nevertheless, there is, uh, there is a possible living development of Marxism, which could be the basis for this kind of society. Whether you have the political conditions in which this kind of thing could happen in Eastern Europe is another question. I think it's very, very different. So far in this discussion, we've confined ourselves, and I think we've been right to do this, to the Marxism of Marx. Yes. But now that we've, so to speak, brought the discussion up to date, and you've been talking about the ferment of ideas going on among contemporary, some contemporary Marxist thinkers, I'd like to just finish the discussion, if I may, by asking you if you'd pick out one or two of the more recent Marxist thinkers and uh, tell us something about the particular developments of Marxism for which they're responsible. Yes. Well, I think that there's two really quite different ones, just to give an example, really quite different areas. One is the Praxis group in Yugoslavia that I was really referring to earlier, which is a set of Marxists who've tried to return to the bases of Marxist humanism and to work out the theory of a libertarian society based on, on Marxism. This is one of the most interesting developments. and. They're, the, they're perhaps the center. Many other people have contributed to it. Uh, they've drawn on a number of other, other thinkers. They've been perhaps, the, in some ways, the more spectacular because the, the bravest of, of this group. Another area completely, Marxism has been very fruitful in developing an economic theory of the world economy. I mean, that's the strength of Marxism, is to see an economic system as a whole, which, as it were, determines the roles of its parts. And the development of a theory of underdevelopment, of the way in which the structure of the world economy, uh, to some extent, forces underdevelopment, actually brings about underdevelopment in certain societies and prevents them from, from developing, attributes certain roles in which societies are, are stuck. I think that's been one of the most fruitful developments of, of Marxist economics. In these two ways, if you like, in an attempt to come to terms with capitalism as it is today, hundred years after Marx wrote Capital and, and very different. And secondly, in an attempt to rediscover libertarian sources in, in Marxism, I think we have perhaps the two most interesting developments of non-official Marxism. Yeah. One outstanding feature of the history of communist countries is, has been that the great political leaders like Lenin and Stalin and Mao Zedong have also had pretensions to be philosophers. Do you actually credit any of them with any outstanding philosophical capacity? No. Philosophical, no. I mean, Lenin, a uh, great political, uh, political strategist, and a very clear thinker about that. Stalin, the less said, the better. Mao, no. I, no. I mean, it would be too much to expect that such men should also be philosophers. So in other words, you think that for, for the new Marxist ideas, we need to look not at... Uh, not to the political leaders, but to the philosophers, to the uh, writers of other kinds, scholars and uh, economists and so on. Yes, and especially not to those political leaders, but precisely to a number of very important thinkers that have, that have come uh, in the Marxist tradition and have added to our, our understanding of it. That is the, that's going to be the groundwork for any new germination. Thank you Marxism. very much. Thank you, Professor Taylor.